Hello, and welcome to the Don't Stop the Education series presented by Sennheiser Sound Academy. Hope everyone's doing amazingly well. Today, we'll continue our crew call series with the team from Harford Sound in Maryland. Uh, this all is a production company with some friends of ours from Sennheiser who we've known for a while, and we're happy to have them on. Uh, before we introduce those guys, I'd like to say hello to Andy Edgerton, who is my co-host. Andy, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks, Tim. Yeah, looking forward to this one. Yeah, me too. I think it's going to be really good. Happy to have these guys on. I think the cameras may be stuck here. Here we go. Hey, Zach. Hey, how are you guys? Good, good. Very good. Evan, Steve, hello. Kyle. Hello. What's happening? Look at those nice choices of microphones these guys have. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sennheiser all the way. <laughs> <laughs> Good, good. Andy, I'll turn it over to you for as we start, then I'll take a, take a few minutes and join myself on the conversation. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining us, guys. I obviously know that your relationship is, is sort of with Tim over in the US there, um, over on the other side of the pond, um, just for, for, for me and as well as the, the viewers that we have. Um, if you could just take a few minutes, tell us a little bit about yourselves, how you got into the industry and how you became uh, to know each other and sort of um, work together. And I will, I guess I'll start with Evan first, please. Yeah, hey, uh, my name's Evan. Uh, I own the place, unfortunately. So uh, I get to work with all these clowns as well. But uh, I got into this, I blame my dad fully. Uh, he was a musician and uh, I used to go uh, with him when I was a kid and uh, run sound for his band. I, you know, he had a little Mackie powered head that I would turn some knobs on and make the vocals loud enough. And, you know, it just kind of grew from there. And I've uh, been doing this a while, toured with uh, this band, All Time Low, for a little while, uh, seven years as their front of house guy. And I met all of these guys along the way. I've uh, known Zach for many years now, Steve for a while, I, and he plays in a band too. And Kyle over there, he's, uh, he's our grumpy house, uh, you know, he's the grumpy guy here and we love him to death. So that's me. <laughs> Well, well, I'm the grumpy guy. <laughs> what an introduction. I mean, we, we need to go to Kyle next, right? Yeah. Hi, I'm Kyle. I'm grumpy, apparently. Um, I got into this, uh, this industry here from uh, just playing music and bands at, uh, while I've grown up. Uh, and I blame Evan kind of for getting me into this because I met him and then it's all been downhill from there. <laughs> and uh, like you said, I'm the resident grumpy guy, but I like to think of myself as the, you know, dive into whatever we have new technology wise and and learn it and be good at it um i forgot to say i'm the director of operations here at harford sound kyle can literally learn everything he started as an audio guy now he's one of our best lighting guys too yeah five years ago i didn't know how to what a gain knob was or a microphone and here i said <laughs> Man. that's great thank you so much let's um let's go around let's go to zach please uh, yeah, hi everybody. My name is Zach, and uh, I'm a warehouse manager here at Hartford Sound. And uh, I got into this just kind of similar to Kyle. I was playing in bands when I was younger, and then uh, had a little PA system, and got all into that. Was doing a bunch of sound for you know local local bands in high school and stuff like that. And uh, got a job working for a for a band that actually uh, opened for All Time Low. So that's how I met Evan. And we were, uh, you know, probably 18 or 19 years old, just super young kids on the road. So I was like, I'm going to make that guy my friend. And uh, here we are. I moved uh, from New Jersey to uh, come down here to take this job. So I'm pretty happy to be well, here. It took eight years for you to finally wise up and come down here. Well, well you know, once I saw the property <laughs> taxes, I was kind of sold. <laughs> Brilliant. And you obviously you made him your friend. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and Steve, last but no yep. means least. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Steve Wozniak. Uh, I am director of sales here at Harford Sound. Um, I got into I got into it a long time ago, started playing in just little bar bands when I was uh, 14 or 15. Um, I'm in a I'm in a band here just outside of Baltimore, Evan was actually uh, our front of house guy and still is when I can pry him away from here and, uh, and some of the bigger stuff. Uh, so he went from, you know, touring with all time low to being, you know, my primary front of house guy. So what a terrible fall from grace that explains uh, all the empty Jack Daniels bottles in his office. 
So, but yeah, position here opened up a couple of years back. I think I've been here two and a half years now. Um, and I just, you know, I sell, I sell our services and I sell these guys. These are all supremely talented guys here. Um, you know, Matt Hinshaw, who's not on here, Kaylee, everybody here makes it easy to, uh, to, to sell what we have going on for sure. They're, uh, everybody's very Absolutely. good at what they do here and, uh, and the gear helps too. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I guess that brings me to my next question, Evan. Then, so how how did it start? How did you decide to to start the company and and sort of grow it and and pull people in? Yeah. I, I again, I, going back, I blame my dad fully for this because you know he was a musician. So I you know started doing sound with him, and uh, my freshman year in high school, uh, one of the students that uh, works for the theater department was like, hey, our spring talent show, we need somebody that can do sound for that. You have gear, right? I was like, I guess I can borrow some of my dad's stuff and do sound. So sure enough, I drug out my dad's, you know, old PV speakers and PV mixer and all that stuff and set it up in the high school auditorium and did sound for the talent show and wasn't nearly enough PA, wasn't loud enough. You know, I learned that clipping amplifiers is very bad for speakers. speakers yeah. and got through it, but it was so exciting. And I kind of just wanted to keep doing it. So I started advertising like, hey, I have this company, I can do sound. And I was like doing uh, church basement shows and just, you know, all these little like local shows and really got involved with the local music scene and uh, met these guys from this band All Time Low. And uh, they were just this little crappy local rock band here in Maryland, but they had, you know, songs that people liked and people would get excited when they played and they could draw like three, 500 people to little like church basements, which was awesome. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I kept in touch with those guys, continue to grow my company. You know, I'd, I'd make 150 bucks doing these shows, but I'd save it up and I'd buy myself a new mixer or a new speaker, a couple new monitors, whatever. And uh, kept growing the company. Finally got the offer to go on tour with the all-time low guys in 2008. They're like, hey, we like you. You want to go on tour? I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? That's just, that sounds like fun. So the company kind of laid dormant for a couple of years. Like I had some buddies here locally that I could trust to go out and run the stuff while I was gone. Um, and the company just kind of became a back burner thing. And eventually I kind of stopped booking shows and just focused on touring, but people kept calling me to do shows locally. So I was like, whatever, I'll keep going. And I finally got uh, to the point where the company was taken off. I was starting to get tired of being on the road and I was like, well, let's just uh, give it our all. And that was uh, in 2013. So we've continued just to significantly grow and expand, you know, hugely up until this year we were here having record years every year. Just, you know, we got great guys, great gear, and we just love working and love what we do. So, you know, it's just been a great success story since. Amazing. Is, is it quite local to Baltimore where you work or do you send packages out for tours and that kind of thing? Yeah, we're mostly a one-off company. We, we do like festivals, uh, you know, a lot of like beer festivals, street festivals. Uh, we're starting to get up into like some of the larger festival stuff, but uh, you know, it's mostly outdoor stuff. We do some corporate stuff, but ugh, that sucks. Um, <laughs> you know, I never really got into the touring, you know, package stuff because I, I know that I beat the crap out of the gear on the road and I know engineers are not friendly to the gear and I don't want to deal with the maintenance on that. You know, yeah. I'd rather just have the stuff stay local where we run it. We at least are around to oversee it and we don't have to deal with the maintenance and, Oh no, a console's down in Chicago. Now I got to find something either in Chicago or overnight a console to Chicago. Yeah. So we've always just kind of focused on the one-off stuff. Fantastic. Brilliant. Uh, I'll, I'm going to pass over to Tim, if I may. Yeah, absolutely. Evan, I'll pick up there before we get to the other guys, but you seem just as a outsider looking in, you seem to have either had a, clear strategy on how you grew this company or put things together really well as you saw opportunities coming and you know I know you guys have come down to Nashville quite a bit and done these Gaylord shows and and you can, you, it's interesting you hear the chatter around town that this production company is coming from Maryland getting all of their work here for these corporate shows how, how did you how did you get into what what was your idea for putting the strategy or the, the makeup of your business plan together, which I think I mean, is genius. I think you filled a niche that wasn't there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, our strategy has always been the same. It's, you know, the most friendly approach possible. It's good people with good gear and, you know, get the job done without any hassle. Like we want to make it the least amount of stress for anybody that works with us. So 
you know, we want to have somebody that's confident that can go out and do the job, somebody that's friendly that can go out and make the client feel good about us doing the job and then just have the good gear that we don't have to worry about breaking down. So it's always been the same approach always. And I know Steve can chime in too, because, you know, he deals with a lot of the clients too. And it's just, you know, we try to be nice and friendly with everybody. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Like I said before, it's really easy to, to sell our company at this point to, to potential clients. Uh, they, they kind of see our track record and then we, we, we show up on site and if they don't know we're there, we know, we know that we're doing a good job. Um, you know, we've, uh, just like any company, I think we've had a clear vision of where we where we wanted to be and, and still where we want to go. Um, and you know, a lot of it a lot of it was luck. But you know, sometimes I think you 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 make your own luck. And when you have a nice core team in place and everybody's rowing in the same direction, um, you know, and everybody for the most part handles situations and people the same way, it makes it makes things really easy. And then we just keep getting those calls, um, you know, for these things. It, it comes pretty easily when uh, when you have good people. Yeah, it's been a lot of uh, just Very natural good. word of mouth growth too. So, yeah. you know, and it's not just us too, because we also have a lot of freelancers that we use and we look for the same qualities in all of our freelance guys too, and make sure they all carry the same ethics and just the, the happiness that we all have. <laughs> can, can you expand on that just for, for sort of anyone watching who's maybe wanting to get into this line of work or anything? What are the sort of positives and the good attitudes that you look for um, that you know that you can send people out on gigs and, and they can relay to the client? Is it friendliness or? Can I chime in on that? Yeah, absolutely. Sure, sure grumpy guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, they all call me grumpy, but I can turn it on when I need to. Oh, um, he, Kyle can go from having the most miserable day ever, <laughs> and then he'll be like, oh, I hate everything, and he'll get on site at the gig and just be like, oh, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. How can I help you? And he's just professional as can be the whole time. A lot and of that that's depends what I on wanted catering. To say. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> you know, we look for people that, you know, can interface with clients, first of all, understand what they have and how to put it together. That's a uh, given. Um, people that can interface with the clients and, you know, be nice. It doesn't matter what is going on in your personal life. Don't drag your personal life into this work. It's only going to bog you down, you know, and somebody who can um, troubleshoot and will not get everything when you're trying to troubleshoot something because 99% of the time, you know, something's going to go wrong. Something's not going to be as you planned. So, you know, we're looking for problem solvers and, uh, and generally good people. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. The people skills are the most important thing. It's like when we go through screening to find new freelance guys or to hire new people, it's like, I don't really care about your mixing resume. I want to know that you're a good hard worker. I want to know that you're going to have a great attitude. And I want to know that, you know, you can think on your feet. Um, honestly, it sucks to say, but most people don't care about how it sounds. They want the bands yeah. to start on time. They want the gear to work. They want the show to progress on schedule. And like, yeah, it's great if it sounds good too. But if the band's 15 minutes late, you're going to hear about that all day. They're not going to care that the vocals sounded really good and was crisp and clear. It's like they, they want the bands to start on time. Yeah, yep. I think all those skills can be learned um, on the technical side of things. But first and foremost, you need, you know, you need the good attitude and the good work ethic. And if you're a good person, you know, the, the other stuff, you know, you know, the, these guys can drag you along and teach it to you for sure. That's yeah, and great. I know a lot of a lot of people want to, you know, come out of school and be like, oh, I'm just going to mix bands and that's all I'm going to do. But it's like, you're not going to mix bands for a while, especially coming out of school. You're going to yeah. push cases and like wrap feeder and wrap XLR cables. And maybe you'll get to babysit the console while the A1 goes and grabs a coffee or something. As the sales guy, you just described all of my jobs when I work the shows with you guys. <laughs> that sounds kind of like the Southwest strategy, hire for attitude, train for job. Right. And you know, that's kind of what they do. But um, so that brings me to a question I was thinking about, because I know early on, you guys would, if, if you had a show coming up for a smaller thing, I would see on social media, you would be looking for people to, to help out on a, on a show. How did you vet those people? Or were they people you already knew? And that's just the quickest way to get in touch with them. Uh, the yeah, the, the, the great thing with social media is it's very easy to get in touch with a lot of people at one time. And when I, you know, I do post a lot on my personal Facebook, like, hey, we're short staffed, could use another guy. And a lot of times it's, oh, I didn't remember that guy was in the area. And he messages me and I'm like, oh yeah, I know that guy. I know he can do a good job. Or it's just like, 
we're really short staffed this weekend. Who's available? And it's just like, if somebody messages me, I see their, their mutual friends. I'm like, okay, they might be a decent guy. Let me reach out to their mutual friends, ask how they are. And I kind of do some research on the people. And if, you know, they get a good enough review, we'll give them a chance. And, you know, we've, we've had some poor hires before and we've had some issues and, you know, it's, it's always a learning experience, but we get through it and nothing's, you know, been that detrimental that we can't uh, find a solution at the end of the day to get, you know, through something. Had some interesting right. truck drivers, though. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Those are a specific breed that, uh... <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, nice. laughing, I'm laughing so much because I've, I've toured the U.S. a lot, and it was the same with the bus drivers. It was some, I've met some real interesting characters <laughs> with the buses and the, buses and the trucks. There's, Sorry, Tim. Yeah, well, a driver is an interesting breed. Yeah. Well, you have to be awake when everyone's sleeping, and you know, get, <laughs> get all get all of your conversation in when they come to the come to the uh, the driver's yeah. area for five minutes. It's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I got five minutes to tell you everything I want to talk about right now, right. and they seem to get it through. But Steve, I, I'm curious uh, on the sales side of things. Do you are, are you beating the bushes, or, or is it more referrals? How, how do you approach that? It I've often wondered okay. what, what that is in a growing company. It's, it's a combination of, of things. You'll, you'll obviously get referrals through, um, through existing accounts and clients. Um, but, you know, a lot of it can be, you know, for, it, it feels like we've been around a long time, but, you know, the company is still in its infancy and we're a long way from where we want to be. So in some instances, it is, it is a matter of cold calling and explaining, you know, who you are, uh, scrolling Facebook and looking for different events that are happening in the region. Um, and trying to reach out in a professional way to uh, find the right person to talk to um, or, you know, find, find who is in charge and say, hey, we'd love to throw our hat in the ring and put a bid in on this. This is kind of what we do. Um, but with any kind of, you know, sales calls, I mean, as, as we all know, you what convert maybe 3% of those. But over time, that, that does kind of add up. And then, you know, that client will know somebody and, and so on. And they tell two friends and they tell two friends. <laughs> and then... Uh, and then it's, 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 it's one of those things. So it's, it's a combination of the two at this point. Um, we were really getting to the point where our schedule was just so full up of existing clients and, and brand new ones. And like Evan alluded to earlier, we were on, on track to have our, our, our biggest year ever. Um, and, you know, if, if all these clients survive and these festivals survive and, you know, and, and our arena work comes back, I think we're, we're going to be in really good shape going forward. Very cool. I, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. Uh, all the people watching out there, if you have questions, please send them our way and we'll feed them into the conversation uh, where, where they seem to fit in the best. So please keep sending them our way and we'll start putting those in. Um, I'll, I'll take what you just said, Steve, and go to Kyle. Um, you're having your best year ever. More opportunities coming in. When do you, when do you tell Evan to start building more speakers? <laughs> well, uh, I won't, I won't say names, but uh, the main speakers we have, the company doesn't like that Evan builds his own speakers. They're trying to get us on their stuff. <laughs> but um, You've built some really good stuff, though, right? Yes, absolutely. He's got yeah. a great sub, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. but, um, so I, I guess, really, when, when do you start to, say, to go to Evan and say, dude, our opportunities are more than our equipment here, operations-wise, we need to invest? Well, I like to say double double. So about every off season, I'll come to him and and tell him to buy twice, if not more, of what we already have. Um, this past season, we bought a whole bunch of video wall, um, a lot more lighting, um, more audio, more, 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 and more audio. Always getting audio, um, and you know it it kind of sucks because you know we had like. Everybody else was saying the biggest year we were ever going to have. We were looking at the schedule thinking like, oh, my gosh, we're going to just go straight nonstop for four or five months <laughs> and be dead afterwards. And, um, you know, it's hard after something like this happens to sit around and, and think like, what the heck are we going to do now? You know, so I don't know. But right. every winter it seemed to, you know, come down to let's buy more this let's buy more of that we've got mobile stages we got lights we got video we got everything you could ever want just sitting here now 
Yeah, last last fall, literally like every weekend, Kyle's like, we got to buy more stuff. I'm like, well, let's just get through the season and see what we yeah. really need. <laughs> and it was just every weekend, like shortages. Thankfully, we have a very good network of friends that have similar gear, so we can easily cross rent stuff. But uh, you know, we did what 32 days straight last fall of just yeah. nonstop go go go. We thought uh, at the end of August that we were good, you know, it was going to slow down for a bit. And then all of a sudden <laughs> we did about 30 some days, almost 40 days straight. Almost. I think the longest day we worked was what, like 22, 23 hours. <laughs> Something like that. I remember getting back at like two in the morning and flipping gear into new trucks, yeah. and not sleeping. <laughs> it would have been immensely helpful to have Zach on hand for that last year. I know he's, he's the newer hire here. And he's been able to eat the one positive is he's been able to ease into things a little bit. And he's a great carpenter and builds a lot of our cases and, and this, that, and the other thing, but it would really, it would really be, uh, have been helpful to us last year when we were flipping gear and going crazy to have, you know, someone like Zach here, keeping track of everything and making sure that things were going where they were going. But, uh, you know, when that time comes again, he'll be ready for it. Yeah, poor Matt, our warehouse guy last year, he was just so overwhelmed because he would be in the shop flipping, prepping gear. We'd all be helping him, and then he'd have to go out and mix a show too, and we just didn't have any dedicated people to stay in the warehouse, and we were all just getting run into the ground. I was like, oh, we need somebody else so bad, and thankfully, Zach was available, and uh, I was like, man, you're going to have a really busy year, and you're not going to get any sleep, and you're going to be working hard, and man, he's had one of the easiest jobs ever since he got hired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets to be friends with us. That's that's the biggest thing. That's priceless. What a great time. <laughs> I, Zach, when I did you it. move down? In the end of November, came down. So okay. early November. Gotcha. Now that you're mentioning your carpent carpentry skills, did you get that from the theater side of things? I got it uh, from my dad, who's a carpenter, and uh, okay. From when I was really young, there was kind of no no restrictions on anything like he's just like here's a saw here's a hammer go do go do this like i was like shooting a nail gun when i was like 10 years old and um my first job i guess was working for my dad like doing carpentry and building decks and doing trim and all that kind of stuff and uh once i got into the the theater stuff i kind of expanded upon it and then now that i'm here just at a point was furiously building road cases for the, uh, you know, busiest season ever upcoming. And then uh, that all came to a halt very quickly. <laughs> yeah. When I hired Zach, one of the things was, Hey, I need you to build about uh, 20 road cases in a month and a half. Is that possible? And Zach's never built, you know, a true road case before with all the aluminum extrusion and everything. And he's like, I guess I can figure it out. And there was a good hustle for a couple of weeks where he was like a case a day. And then, you know, things drastically changed and then, then it became a case a month. <laughs> but he finally wrapped up the project, so it's all done. Yeah, now it's time to build a road case for my whiskey collection. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we've been talking about it. But, yeah, 3,000 rivets later, they're all done. And uh, 3,000? I thought it was 1,000 rivets a case. It's 200 for a third pack and 216 for a half pack. <laughs> Riveting. Riveting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just mute me. He's got, he, too. he's got it down to the exact number per case. There you go. Good planning. That's Zach. He's the most organized so, guy I've ever met. <laughs> so you guys were talking about how things changed since uh, in the in the past couple of months. Zach did the uh, the the flip to to doing broadcast over social media and stuff. That building that whole outfit to that lie on you did you guys all jump in as a team with the idea oh no it was all it was all a team thing and we were just really excited to do it i think when we kind of figured out like hey this could be cool it was one of those things where you know because we're all friends too so you kind of forget that you're at work and that you're working and you kind of the uh i'm doing a fun project with my friends vibe kind of just kicks in and that's still really how i feel about any of the streams like we all come in and you know the band comes in and it's it's you know one band so there's nothing to stress out about and uh it's we just have a really good time ever yeah nice. yeah we have a so really good the, time with it when did that idea start to uh to put together the streaming studio well i think uh, we kind of had it to? we kind of had it in our minds that when things went down we would have to pivot and adjust a little bit originally 
uh, we got all the shop guys together and we just made uh, just a fun one-off music video. Um, and it was, it was so well received and it was just, you know, kind of lighthearted and different. And we saw the kind of, you know, social media reach we could have. Um, and it just kind of helped people forget about things for a little bit uh, and laugh a little, which we all need. Um, but we got, you know, one or two bands in here initially. We weren't, we're not, we have video wall, but we're not video guys per se. So we were really kind of learning on the fly. My band came up here and did the first stream. We were kind of the guinea pigs. Nothing exploded. Nothing was terrible except probably us. Um, but every, every, everything kind of went smoothly with that, and it kind of progressed from there. The rig has grown, uh, and it's been, it's been a lot of fun, and we're getting a lot of different bands up here, and it's, it's really nice to have people come to you rather than send gear out. So like sometimes when a, when a football player – uh, holds out on his contract or sits out a year or does something else you're saving wear and tear on the body i think that a lot of that's help uh, happening with the gear as well right on so have, have you been promoting that in a sales fashion of hey guys we've, we've got a way for you guys to promote your artist or what's the sure yeah absolutely a lot of these bands are itching to reach their audience and they they need to play number one just because as a musician you can't imagine life without touching strings and feeling the music and, and, and things like that. So to give artists an outlet rather than, and, and we see a lot on here, whether it's, uh, you know, superstars or, or, or local guys, people just in their bedrooms and backyards with an iPhone. Uh, and that's great. And that has a certain amount of reach. And we love when people churn out content because that's, that's what life's about. You want to you wanna share your gift and your music. But we were fortunate enough to have the gear on hand and have um, the, the staff we do here to really learn that end of the business. And then, you know, just the people that Evan knows and I know and, and Kyle and Zach and Matt, and we're able to reach out to bands we know and say, hey, we got something cool up here, you know, come up here and check it out. And they would kind of say, OK, maybe they would view one or two of the streams and say, this is this is a real deal thing. Uh, you know, we impressed ourselves and I think we impressed some other people with what we were able to pull off and, you know, with, with help from Sennheiser, especially, we know everything was going to sound on point and, uh, you know, these bands are able to reach their audience even at a strange time like this. Right. I know, I know the first time I tuned in, I was like, wow, the production value of this is beautiful because you've been seeing everyone singing from their bedroom and living room or kitchen or whatnot. And then... I shifted over to you guys and it, it looked wonderful. And, and I'm just wondering, how'd you have that much room in your shop to build that out? Uh, we had to move oh, some no. things around. <laughs> uh. We started with a, a more scaled back rig that fit perfectly between our shelves in one of the rows in the warehouse. So it wasn't that much work to do it. And Kyle came up with the design for both rigs and, you know, <clears throat> The biggest thing was when we started streaming, we, we're not video guys. We're barely lighting guys. Like, audio is our thing. Hey, so, hey well, Kyle's a great the, lighting guy. <laughs> Kyle's the lighting guy now. Like, he, he has just blown us all away with what and he's done. And the stream like, guy. <laughs> and the stream guy. But, yeah, before this all started, this streaming stuff, we had no idea what we were doing with video. Like, we had just bought a video wall last year because I wanted to be able to do video on some gigs. Thank God I bought that video wall because it's the only thing yeah. working right now. Oh, but, yeah. uh, you know, we knew how to fly a video wall and put logos on it. We didn't know how to do cameras and switching and all this stuff. And we learned real fast. And it's been a lot of trial and error as we've been growing. And, you know, can, every stream we continue to learn something new and improve. And I, I got to say, these guys have been killing it. Like, all of our guys have just buckled down during this quarantine and learned so much about video. And I'm very impressed with what we've been able to do. And, you know, as the streaming stuff really took off, we went from this little rig crammed between the shelves into a much larger rig, as Kyle just pulled up on the screen there. Uh, we had to remove two rows of shelves. We had to, we spent a day just like taking pictures of where the shelves are, what's on the shelves, marking the uprights. And uh, we've had, you know, a lot of bigger bands starting to come in. And now we have, you know, a 30 foot by 30 foot performance area. And it's, uh, it's got a lot of lights. It looks really good. Look at that analog Heritage 3000 that me and Zach bought. Well, you could you leave it on that picture, and I'm a happy guy. I love those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it looks wonderful. So it's 30 by 30, 
is the performance area and then how much behind the cameras how much space is behind the cameras that you're working from enough <laughs> uh, enough just enough <laughs> it gets a little tight back there but i mean we've in the warehouse uh i don't know if kyle's a picture of it, but in the warehouse we have uh monitor console lighting console and video world out there and then in what used to be our repair shop we have the heritage switch with the uh, broadcast audio and then we have our video switching done in there so we've got two separate rooms and uh it's a little tight but it all works out i got a picture hold on <laughs> there it is oh no not yet there it is <laughs> oh okay yeah, so there that, that that's our warehouse so that's the space behind so we've got three cameras in the front line there a couple more gopros we use for other shots and then the little tech world per se there in the back right under the preview monitor is probably the most important thing oh, that, that, you, that, that, that you see <laughs> <laughs> that was good, uh, nice oh, that's what a real show looks like yeah, weird. yeah. <laughs> so so you've got the uh, midas set up in another room yeah gotcha gotcha yep, so and then an, another germany another german company speakers uh for reference monitors in there uh -huh. gotcha so the uh what made you go with the midas just because you like it um or well originally we started was with it just SXL. a project or yeah me me and zach i we, i guess we were drinking one night and we were like how cool would it be yes. to have? <laughs> how cool would it be to have like you know a nice analog <laughs> console and then zach found this the heritage on uh reverb for uh he had listed it a little under three grand or something and I'm like, oh, this has got to be broken oh or something. Like, yeah, that console for $3,000. Meshes the dude. It was like sitting in a studio. So we lowballed him at like 2K, and he didn't take it. So we let it sit for a couple of days and came back and finally negotiated. We $2,400 for a 48 channel Heritage 3000. And it's in, you know, really good shape and works great. So it's just been a fun project that me and Zach have been doing and buying analog outboard and spending too much money on things we shouldn't be spending money on. And it's funny when we have visiting engineers that come up here and, and mix some of the larger acts, they're, uh, they're, they're tickled with it. It's kind of a blast from the past for them to be, you know, running up and down this large board and spinning knobs and kind of doing their thing. And there's a certain, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a sales guy, but I've learned a lot from these guys. And, you know, just being a musician as well, there's a certain um, alive quality that, um, that, that these boards have. And when you're doing something in... Yep, there you go. And if you're doing something in, you know, a sterile environment uh, without a true front, uh, you know, uh, without a true PA in the room, uh, it's nice to add a little bit of warmth and excitement to to the broadcast audio. And I think that's what a board like that does. And I think Zach can agree with me here. It's really made you rethink your approach to mixing because with, you know, the digital consoles, you've got everything you need everywhere. But with the analog, it's like, we don't have that much outboard. And we have to, you know, think about where we want to use the comps and how we want to use it. So I know, at least for me and Zach, I, I definitely know for Zach, it, you've had to reapproach the way you mix. And, and it's been fun kind of just to uh, do a little more bare bones, on the, especially on these broadcasts. Mic choice helps too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah thank you. You know, these uh, good Sennheiser mics always make it sound better. Nice. Thanks. Well, Evan, I know you come from the, the break point in the era between digital and analog and I kind of, I'm a bit older. I came from a little bit before the break point. And, and what you said about choices, you know, when we would advance shows, it's like fairs and festivals, you know, I got four comps, four gates and two reverbs and a delay. <laughs> can you make, can you make it work? Well, what are you going to say? No. Yeah. Artist wants to get paid. So you have to go and figure out how to mix it. So, but it, it, it makes you, it makes you go after it from, it from does, yeah. the start with your ears. Right. Mm -hmm. so. yeah you can't just load up your show file and go you actually got to do some work and it's like yeah. you know me and zach were both touring in the club scene when analog was still you know in every house of blues and all of those venues and like you know i'd be the guy with the 24 channels on the left side of the console and zach would be the guy with the 12 channels on the right side of the console mixing <laughs> the opener and, and he'd really have to make it work sharing Kick overhead snare rack floor yeah. that's it <laughs> <laughs> yep it's like, can I please share your overheads? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's been fun, though, mixing on that console because, uh, at, like, Evan and I were talking the other day, as far as, like, EQ is concerned, we don't even know 
what frequencies we're boosting or cutting. You just turn the knobs until it sounds good. And you're not, you know, so into like looking at, you know, the parametric EQ and getting, you know, trying to make the EQ curve look like something rather than just on the analog board where you're just turning the knobs until you get the sound you want, you know, really just using your ears rather than your eyes and ears. And uh, that's been really fun. I realize how spoiled I am on the S6L. <laughs> so do you guys fight for who's mixing the broadcast? No, it's always Evan. He wins. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the choice of being the company owner is that uh, <laughs> I get to mix the uh, broadcasts. <laughs> it doesn't matter that I own half the console. I've mixed one. <laughs> well, and then there's Zach's right. immense fear of having his live mix live on in infamy forever on, <laughs> on, on the internet. The internet's forever, man. You got to be careful. That's right. You do. I do lights. <laughs> <laughs> For Kyle's every single one. <laughs> Nice. Andy, you, I don't, have, you got anything on your mind over no, there? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, have you ever, because that, that digital to analog thing is, is always um, an interesting one. Have you ever had anyone who's not used an analog come into either guest mix on it or use it where you've had to kind of, because I've, I've seen it from people who've only worked on digital and they come in, they're like, what's this? And it's like, this is an analog. And it's, you know, because we all started an analog and then moved to digital. Have you ever had anyone come in from the other way? And how do you sort of approach that? Not yet. I mean, everybody that we've had has been, you know, at least excited because, you know, we have some younger guys coming. They're like, oh, man, an analog console. Cool. That'll be fun. Like, I, you know, I don't get to use those or often or I've never used one of those. And it's like, okay. And, like, they ask a bunch of questions and they'll do their research and come in and be just fine. And, you know, we just have to help them like, oh, yeah, we have comps here. Blah, blah, blah. You want to be around this level when you're mixing. And other than that, you know, we pretty much just let them do their thing and they're fine. That's brilliant. Fantastic. So com coming out of this, um, like, do, do you, have you learned anything during this time that can maybe live on uh, for when yes. things get back, back to normal, if you like? Uh, I know that you've invested in a video wall and those kind of things. But what, what sort of lessons that, do you think you've learned from this horrible situation that can maybe live on in the company? I think uh, to some extent, the, the streaming thing is going to be, uh, I mean, not as, not as large uh, of, of a thing we push, but definitely an extension of the company and just another service we can provide. Because going forward, I think people are going to have to really, you know, rethink how they, how they approach live shows and, and, getting to their, and getting to their audience. And, you know, who knows how long things are going to drag out. Uh, but having this capability now, just in case this is a long-term thing, it's going to be just another another thing that we can that we can push to people. It helps our bottom line, but more importantly, it helps it helps the musicians you know re reach their people as well. And uh, you know, so to some extent, I think it 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 will be a thing going forward. I don't know how big or how long, but it's just it's it's another avenue at this point that I think will will go on for you know probably quite some time. I, I can and, see that happening with like practice rooms or when people can get into studios again, that they'll be looking for that, for that solution. And so it was, I can't remember if it was Kyle or Zach then who put the, the streaming software. Was that quite an easy thing to do? Yeah. Did you have to sort of research and how did you get around? No, man. That? We, uh, we kind of just learned it by using it. Um, it's very intuitive software, um, open broadcasting system it's or service. Too. It's free. Yeah. Anybody can download it and it's, it makes your streams that much better. Um, it works kind of like a video switcher works where you can um, set up different windows and have like a preview screen and your program screen. Um, and it's just, it's very intuitive and it's, it's pretty simple. The only things we had to mess with was really um, the frame rate and the scaling of the cameras to get it to talk to our switcher. And then um, we learned a lot about uh, capture devices. A good capture card is very important for getting the video into your stream. Um, and uh, just everything talking together is the hardest part. Once that's up and running, we're good to go. Yeah, so that's the vision mixing, isn't it? What about from the audio side? Is there a platform or something that you need to, to be able to run the audio at this, uh, as well? Or is it built into that program? Um, so it, yeah, uh, OBS has, uh, an audio mixer and basically you use any audio interface that you have, or, um, 
what we do actually is embed the audio into the video through our video switcher. Um, and that works really well with delay and everything. But if you don't have a video switcher that you can do that with, an audio interface works great and whatever camera you have works excellent and you can mess around with delay times or whatever you need to um, get it synced up right. Um, what I suggest is we created a, a, a Facebook account just so we can do test streams and stuff on. So anybody out there that wants to stream, definitely test it out, You know, work out all those kinks. Um, and you'll have a great stream. Stuff's easy. That's great information. I, I didn't know any of that. So amazing. Thank you. Cool. Does the OBS have the, the clap function? No, but we uh, uh, lining up the audio. I was talking to some. Not that I've seen, um, but we definitely do that. We'll go out and I'll be like, go, go clap on the camera real quick. And we'll stream it to uh, Steve's uh, Facebook that he made that no, he's got no friends, just us. <laughs> so we can see. Like I said, you know, get on there, Sounds stream right. it out, go live, you know, and uh, and test that stuff out. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was that was the same one. I talked to a friend of mine that was telling me about his broadcast setup, and it said his instructions said go out and clap, and then it automatically was lining up the audio with the oh, video. Oh, really? So Maybe that's a cool plugin. Cool. Cool. I might have but, to research that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll find out which one he used, but I thought that was pretty interesting. But Say that again. You, skip, you broke up there. Sorry, we have a storm here. I, I thought it was pretty interesting. I had not seen that in a video platform before. You know, oh, like, yeah, okay, well, definitely. You took what we used to do because we didn't have time code. So. Yeah, there's, uh, there's all kinds of plugins out there. Um, what I suggest, too, is if, if people are streaming, um, is to do it on PC because Mac doesn't like a lot of the stuff. <laughs> But um, there's if like if you wanted to get into streaming, I suggest getting OBS. Like I said, it's free. Um, they have there's forums and forums and forums online of people doing it. Any sort of problem you run into, somebody's got a solution for. They have all kinds of crazy plugins for like Zoom and stuff, where you can use OBS into Zoom with like a virtual camera and have overlays and and it just everything looks so professional, um, and they make it so easy. It's awesome. And again, anybody can learn this too because we're not video guys and we had no idea how to do yeah. this prior <laughs> to quarantine and all this. So we learned on the fly and like that's how easy and intuitive this stuff is to use that we were able to figure it out. And three months ago, if you asked us to do a stream, we'd be like, oh, how? <laughs> but now it's like second nature for all of us. But well, that's amazing that you've, but you've also now created a show reel so you can use that to promote the business and say look we've done it here's the stream so they can see how professional they look um so you've kind of created a, a small business for yourself by streaming haven't you for for, for the things that you've got it's amazing yeah, the, the sure. bands that you've had that have come into the the warehouse are they bands you know or have they approached you or how, how have you found those uh, I think it's probably been been a little bit of both. Um, you know, initially when we're just kind of talking about the concept of this, without any kind of content to show people, you're kind of just asking them to take a leap of faith and come up here and and do this. And the more bands that came up here were able to snap pictures and take video clips and and be able to try and sell it to other people we know. But then once the streams started hitting Facebook and YouTube more often than not now the bands are are reaching out to us uh you know and now it's getting to the point where you know we're we're pretty steady with those and we're still booking them um but with the caveat that you know as you know real shows not that these aren't real shows start to happen again you know they we we might have to reschedule or or even cancel these all together until we have a permanent solution in place for these streams but you know to your question yeah it's initially it was us trying to sell this to friends and people that we know uh, and, and now more often than not, people are, you know, just, just coming to us, which is the dream, you know, for a sales guy is not having to chase things down all the time. Nice. So did you build your whole video rig to uh, be mobile? Uh, essentially it is now. I mean, it's, it's, it's all in racks and easily tra transported. Um, you know, we, we got to refine it, but right now it's just, you know, a streaming rig that's we've thrown together, but I'm sure, once we get out to do shows again, people are going to want video at shows too. So we'll definitely refine it even more to be able to take it out and gig with it. Very nice. 
Very nice. So at what point did you decide to, to do the happy hour? <laughs> uh, that's actually a funny story there. Uh, we had a friend of ours that we were tra uh, training and doing uh, a little uh, audio class with here, trying to get him, you know, he's really interested, wants to learn. And uh, we set up a little analog Mackie console in the back of the shop one day and was teaching him how to ring out wedges and stuff. And uh, one of our guys, Matt, you know, really talented singer and musician as well. And we were like, well, Matt, get up there and play something and like make him do a monitor mix for you. And like he did, he got that going and like, that sounds pretty good. And then I grabbed a bass and just started playing. And then Zach came over with a snare drum and started playing with brushes. And like, we had this little acoustic uh, trio going in the back of the shop. And uh, it was fun. We played a couple of songs. And the next day I was like, well, what if we like did a thing where we all played on like a stream and tried to raise some money and maybe do something fun with it. And, you know, Kyle's, our expert beer shotgunner so we're like you know maybe we can have him shotgun a couple beers for money and sure enough you know we we threw together nine songs and had a blast with it and you know the first four weeks we did were amazing and then you know again as steve said earlier you can only ask for so much money from your friends before they stop giving so it kind of fizzled out and we'll probably do at least one more show uh just to say farewell and see you in the future but you know it's it's it was it was a fun run <laughs> I think it's natural. There's so much um, content that's available right now for people, you know, videos and things like that. It's, it, you're going to have huge starts and then they kind of go down a bit and they come back and they live forever anyway. But I just want to know, but you guys didn't just do music. You brought a bartender. Oh yeah. That's we, the way, for online. I love it. Well, we wanted to, you know, have it interactive. So, like, if you're drinking at home, like, and tired of making the same two drinks every single day of your life, here's a bartender that can make something easy for you to make at home. And towards the end, we just kind of got silly with it, and we'd bring, you know, Steve was a guest bartender. We have a couple other friends that aren't bartenders, but they'd come up and make a drink, and it'd just be funny. Like, well, here's a, a Jack and Coke, and just glug, 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 glug. glug. <laughs> And it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, the the home pour. I've become yeah. very accustomed to making my the own cocktails pour. over the last couple of months. I think I think it, the happy hour came along at a really good time for for me specifically because I called a bunch of my friends and like, hey, I'm going to go watch this thing. Let's have a couple drinks and chat while we watch these guys play. And it felt like you were somewhere other than your house, and it was it was very timely. So I commend you for that. Nice. Yeah, thanks. Really and awesome. it was also a good way to showcase our gear too. It was fun for us. Um, but, it, you know, in addition to the streams that are generally just targeted to whatever artist is up here, this was something a little more, a little more broad that even people who aren't in the audio world, that's something we could direct them to. Uh, and, you know, we could, we could show off all of our, you know, you Sennheiser stuff and all of our video wall and lights and, and everything like that. So it was, you know, more or less a happy hour for us, but, you know, also a little commercial too, which was helpful. Right. And so, so as you were micing things up for your happy hours, since it's just you guys, did you decide, let's try some crazy things that we've never tried before because we're not under pressure. We just see if it works and just mess around. We, we did a lot a of play. Bit. Yeah, we, we definitely played around with some stuff. And then, you know, a good buddy of ours sent us some uh, microphones and uh, we started using those. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw you had four snare drum microphones once. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we would definitely. That's pretty uh, interesting. I think we've. Ex we went, Zach. How long did we go without using a fifty-seven on stage? I think the first time a fifty-seven came out was three weeks ago, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so we made it like three months without using a fifty-seven. Like you know, everybody loves a fifty-seven, but it's like, well, let's see what we can put on this instead. And like, I mean, we used a nine hundred four on Guitar Cab a couple of days ago, and that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I know Zach. Uh, went back in history and pulled one of my favorite classic microphones a 903 apparently has it in a glass case somewhere but but i think you i saw you had a 906 on the snare once and and a bunch of different things and i just i'm kind of the same way i'll spend days here in the studio just swapping microphones and running se several different things and just listening and it's amazing what you discover sounds better than you expected when it's not the, the typical recommended application yeah, we've, yeah. we've had a lot of fun experimenting. Yeah. The, the 906 is one of my favorite snare drum mics. It yeah. works snare very bottom, well on snare right? bottom. Yeah. Yep. 
I love it's a, it's so low profile and easy to slide in there too. So it it sounds good and works well. Hey, on Tom's too, man. Yeah, just oh, yeah. slide her right in there. That's what she said. <laughs> yeah, and it'll take and it'll take a great hit too. Oh yeah, you can nail it. It keeps on going. So, um, have you guys learned anything or had opportunities come up that you didn't expect during the pandemic? That someone reached out and said, "Hey, we got we need something for a corporate thing or whatever that that was surprising." That you were like, yes. Well, I think we never we'll thought we were going to get future. into the to the drive-in movie game, um, but you know that's that's something oh, yeah. we have the that we have the capability to do with our mobile stage and our plethora of uh, you know of, of video panels. Um, so so that's something interesting and fun, and that that was definitely not on our radar probably up until this point. Uh, worship services, you know, are, are another thing. Graduations, like Evan mentioned earlier, the video wall is probably you know it most certainly is the only thing that's working for us right now uh, while all of this is going on. So I think everything's been a little unexpected, you know, at, at this point. Yeah. We're, we're just adapting to whatever is thrown our way at this point. If somebody needs something, we'll figure out a way to make it happen uh, because there is no normal right now. And there's no, you know, throw a PA in a truck and go do a gig. It's uh, throw a video wall in a truck and socially distance yourself and, you know, figure out how to make all this happen. And, it, Put on your hard hat and your mask and get the yeah. video wall up. Yeah, that was a fun one we just did the other day. We had to wear a hard hat, mask, had to go buy a pair of jeans because they wouldn't let me in with shorts. It's just, you know, different different experiences every day. Are, are you guys doing a lot of installs now too? It, the, there has been a surprising amount of uh, work on installs. We've been servicing a lot of places that, uh, you know, are in dire need of servicing, but now they're closed and actually can, you know, justify spending some money while they're not you know needing to be open every day and uh there's actually a club in town that's coming back that uh tried to be a dance club and didn't work out so well but now they're going back to music so we're helping them get going again and just you know and anybody that calls us with anything we will do what they need at this point grass cutting boat washing <laughs> so so you so you um you mentioned the club that's coming back uh have they, have they done quite a few changes in there or you just have to kind of retune things? No, they, uh, I've been there. I know the one you're talking about. So, yeah, they ripped the, the stage out, put in a massive DJ booth and, uh, you know, basically made it so you couldn't play a band in there and the owners, you know, they had a good run with it, I think. Uh, uh but kids want music again. So they're trying to go back to their roots and get the, uh, the venue back the way it belongs. So they're rebuilding the stage, uh, where, uh, you know, unfortunately, the EDM music was very hard on the system, so we're replacing a lot of components in there and getting her back to the glory days now. Very nice. You're talking about the drive-in thing. What, uh, what did you have to invest in for that FM transmitting, or is that something you had, we already you had to build FM from scratch? Yeah, oh, Evan does we, a crazy Christmas light uh, thing every year where he uh, <laughs> orchestrates the Christmas lights on his house to – go to different songs so he already had an fm transmitter <laughs> yep see evan you're What's a light range guy? on that for years <laughs> uh it's a seven watt transmitter so you know it's enough for like a drive-in movie i don't i don't know the exact range but you know i've only i've only used it for christmas lights for the last 10 years so <laughs> i know it works for people sitting in front of my house <laughs> i think you should think about getting into the christmas light business for what they charge for that down here it's whatever it takes dollars for a car so and they have lines ago? of cars to go through. I think they make like forty thousand dollars in a week. Oh wow! wow. We uh we actually decorated yeah. a building uh, downtown Baltimore two years ago and did the whole light show to that. And it was cold and uh, it was high up in the air, and I didn't like it. <laughs> we we had one of our guys hanging over the side of the roof with a staple gun, and Kyle was holding him so he didn't fall over the hedge. And he was just stapling Christmas lights to the side of the building. Look, David Goldstein said, will it work in a big parking lot in D.C.? It sure will. We'll find out this afternoon, David. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have a drive-in today? Uh, Sunday. And uh, one of our Sunday. buddies is watching. Yeah. So oh, we're right going to uh, test it today. Because, again, we've never done it. And we're going to make it work like we always do. That's instilling confidence so, in our client right there. <laughs> what's, the, uh, what's the entertainment for this one? 
Uh, it's a movie of some sort. If uh, David's actually watching, he can probably chime in. But uh, yeah, it's some kind of movie. Very good. Let's see if he chimes in there. I have a little question <clears throat> just from you've touched on it a couple of times, especially with um, refurbing some gear. And, and I know that Zach mentioned problem solving earlier. Just for, for anyone watching who's kind of looking to start in the industry and sort of maybe work at a PA company, can, can we go back to, the, to problem solving? Like, what is the, what, you know, is it soldering? Is it, I know you mentioned tuning and learning frequencies for, for mixing wedges. Like what, what sort of top five tips would you give someone for problem solving or what they absolutely need to know as a basic? Signal flow. Signal flow. That's what I was going to say too, buddy. You need to know how the system goes together, right? So you got your signal to your mixer, your mixer to your amp, your amp to your speaker. And if something, if there's an air gap in between, it ain't going to work. <laughs> yeah, and same thing goes with power, too. It's like, if this monitor is not turning on, why? And, you know, go trace and make sure the quad's actually plugged into something. It's like the dumbest things will trip you up every time. It's, you know, you forget to plug in your drive snake to your amp rack. Oh, that's why it's not working. It's, you know, you'll spend 10 minutes like, oh, what's going on? And then you finally calm down and realize, oh, wait. Then L4 is not clicked all the way in. Oh. <laughs> Actually, yeah. uh, Evan, I don't know uh, if you remember, but uh, it was back don't in the have day. To yell, Zach. I'm just saying words. Uh, <laughs> it was at Starland Ballroom, and we couldn't get the stage box for your console to come on. And you called the company, and, and then you opened up the back of the rack, and you're like, well, if I plugged it in, <laughs> that would have been uh, really helpful. Yep, the little things. And again, yeah, it's, it's being a Go ahead. Well, it's, it's being able to remain calm and collective. Like when something doesn't work, you don't just freak out and go, oh, my God, what's going on? It's like <laughs> you got to start thinking about it and not just like, you know, call me or call somebody. It's like, well, wait a second. Why? Why isn't it working? And try to figure that out before you freak out. So would you start at one end? Or how would you? Because yeah. I, I always start at one end. Like my yeah, me too. I kind of develop a system of, you know, kind of not quite step by step, but you know, when you have a system that you need to put together and you know it thoroughly, then you can go back in your head and figure out, okay, well, I did this, this is plugged in, you know, this has power and you can kind of go back through your steps and see where you might've missed, you know? So it's good to, and a lot of our stuff is, it's not different from each other. You know, all of our stuff kind of goes together the same way, be it big, or small, you know? Um, so it's kind of good to get, you know, those steps in your head, really learn the system that you're on and get comfortable or really learn that signal flow. And then that way you can go back and figure out like, okay, my, maybe I missed this step. Like, I don't remember plugging this in, go check this, you know, it's good to have gotcha. a system. And thankfully the, the, the companies that we work with and the equipment that we've, you know, kind of use as the foundation for, for Harford sound, the stuff, doesn't fail by and large, you know, thankfully, and it comes as a great relief that it's, you know, user error or just something silly that can be easily fixed. But if something were to fail, um, you know, the guys, you know, that, that, that work here have the ability to, you know, to repair things or repurpose gear at a gig and really think on their feet. Um, so, you know, whether it's something that's a big deal or a very small deal, you know, all these guys are really adept at, uh, at, at adapting on the fly and 99% of the time, the client doesn't know a thing, you know, there's really no reason to ever alarm them unless something is on fire and then you can't really hide that. And also what, building on what Steve says and Kyle too, it's like one of my biggest things from the get go with this company is consistency and having the same everything. Like we don't have special specialized amp racks that well this rack only does this this rack only does this it's like every single amp rack we have is the setup the exact, exact, exact can do anything like i like the same stuff we have work boxes they're all the same mic stand kits are all the same consoles you know we have pairs of everything at least and it's just you know repetition because if something is 
set up this way for one gig, it's going to be the same at the next gig too. It's not can reconfiguring amp racks, like pulling wires out. It's like, I want everything to be the same. And it makes it a lot easier for text to troubleshoot and set up as well. Cause it, it's the same. Yeah. And if, if you want to expand, it's almost modular, isn't it? You just add another yeah. amp rack, another exactly. set scales up and scales down. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And then just to, to the point of, because you said that you had someone in learning the frequencies and ringing out wedges, I think like, because we just sort of skipped over that, but I can't, because I used to do some monitors, and like, I cannot overemphasize how important it is to just learn like a graphics spectrum. So like, could you, could you sort of give us a few tips on like, what was that person who came in? Like, what, how did you advise them and, and sort of get them to ring out the wedges? Because a few people watching this might know what, might not know what ringing out wedges is or what a crossover point is on a speaker or a coax or, or those, those types of things. Zach, why don't you take that one? You're the monitor guy, <laughs> the, the unwilling monitor guy. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, when, when we had him in, we kind of just tried to instruct him on, you know, you know, some singers are going to cup the mic and then this is where it's going to feed back or just kind of having him, uh, purposely make some feedback and then asking him you know do you think that's a high frequency or a low frequency and uh you know and then trying to go from just is it high or low to okay is it a high mid or a low mid and kind of have him try and be able to pinpoint it on on his own and kind of like use his own reasoning and uh luckily he's i mean he's a very intelligent kid so he was uh he was really good at it but just as uh you know, you have to get them to uh, learn it in their head and kind of give them their own frame of reference. Like um, when I, I used to be a teacher teaching audio and I used to tell kids all the time, I'm like, guys, the bell for lunch is a 1K tone. So when you hear some kind of feedback, think, is that pitch higher or lower than the lunch bell? And that kind of was like a good frame of reference for them. What is this a screaming baby? Is it 2K or something? I should have had the two graphics in my house for that period of my life. <laughs> for, for fun too, with... now. Go ahead. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the nice thing these days is there's, you, every kid has a smartphone. Everybody has a smartphone now. And there's apps that you can download that help you identify frequencies. So when you're learning, you can have your smartphone and look at it and see like, oh, that's that frequency. Okay, that's what that sounds like. And eventually you start to remember that, okay, that little line at 2K on my phone, that's what it sounds like. And then you don't really need your phone so much. So the tools are readily available now for anybody to learn on the fly real quick. And that's, you know, it, it's so much different now, you know, especially Tim, you know, I'm sure you can say years ago, you didn't have a smartphone to ring out wedges. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, I was gonna say for fun, I took my daughter couple of years ago and made a CD of 30 second tones of the 31 frequencies and I put it on random and gave her a DBX EQ and I said okay grab it when it comes up and turn it down and she's like it took about a week and she figured it out she's five you know nice. but it was it was association you know that's three years ago she's eight now but that's how I learned and I wanted to see if she could do it and she picked it up much quicker than I did when I was 16. But, you know, it's, uh, to me, when you ring out wedges or, or anything like that, it's like you, you're you taught colors. You can be taught tones. Yeah. It just takes it, some time to do it. Thanks yeah, for well, that. Because it, it is that, that um, I just wanted to ask you guys, because there is a few fundamental things that I think when people want to start getting into audio, that they skip over. They just want to jump on the console and make things sound. But I think you've nailed it when you said like signal flow, problem finding, like which end to start at and learning that fr those frequencies. I think that's, they're the first three, I think, in it from, from, from my opinion. Sorry, I think I cut you off there, Evan, sorry. Oh, that's all right. I was just going to say when I was learning about uh, feedback and stuff, I had one of those PV uh, graphic EQs with the little lights above each uh, frequency. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember so, that. So, you know, I could, oh, yeah. that helped me identify feedback. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a tool for everybody, and you just got to figure out what works and how to use it, and you'll, you'll learn. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I, I remember, you know, my dad, just like yours, Evan, was in a band and stuff, and he said, just turn it down. That's too loud. I'm like, what? And then I'm 
figured out that you could just pull certain frequencies. It was amazing uh, concept that you don't have to turn the whole thing down. But yeah. you don't know that when you first start, it's something to learn. And you know, don't be afraid to try, right? Yep. But also don't bury yourself in a hole where you EQ everything away and then all of your levels gone. Yep. Yeah. I see plenty of people do that too. And it's like, well, maybe you should put some of those back in instead of just turning you up louder. Yeah, exactly. It's like you're clipping your outputs. Maybe you should look somewhere else <laughs> in the chain and see what else is going on here. Or move your wedge because it's right behind your super cardioid mic. Yeah. <laughs> That kind of thing. But, you know, these are things you have to learn. Yeah. I, I just know that we, we get a lot of people watching these webinars, like after as well, as well as live, that are kind of logging on to kind of, you know, get a few lessons. And so thanks for, thanks for covering those. Did you mention you had a mobile stage? So, because I'm trying to count here, you've got a video wall, oh, audio. Yeah. you got a mobile stage as well. Do you have deck, deck as Two well? Two. Yeah, we have. What uh, are they have, like? Are they the they're awesome. stages? Yeah, there are two. We have two SL one hundreds, the stage lines. Um, I'm trying to get Evan to get that two sixty, but uh, you know, Corona kind of put a damper on that. Um, but they're great, man. One of them is the brand new one, so the rigging is uh, quite a bit more than it was. I think the PA points are a uh, thousand pounds a piece. Um, fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred pounds a piece. Wow. <laughs> yeah, they're great. And they go up with ease and they come down with ease. And they're probably one of the best things we've ever bought. And yes, we have decks as well. So we do, we do staging. If you need a stage, we do staging. So, right. So, yeah, so, so it is a one-stop shop for, for the Absolutely. whole shebang. Fantastic. It's not we're all often confused. You know, it says Harford Sound in the name, but we're much yeah. more than an audio company these days. No, and all the backdrops and scrims that uh, that different clients have, we can do all the branding on the SL100, and we do all that stuff in house as well. You know, we can we can design all of their stuff, and you know, they just if people come to us with a concept, yep. we can you know provide them with a turnkey solution to pretty much anything. Yeah, I used to work at a sign shop, so uh, I I design <laughs> banners and can get them printed, and vehicle letter all our vehicles and stuff are all lettered by me, and our stages are lettered up, and so all the graphics for the streams that has helped tremendously too. Adobe Illustrator is, you know, we can make any overlay, any graphics for any bands that need them, or so that's helped a lot. It sounds like a very innovative company. So, like Evan, I guess with you driving it, what? At what point did you think, you know, I just don't want to be just an audio company. I'm going to expand so it can be like a turnkey solution. Like how, at what point did you make that decision or decide to do that? Every time that I invest in something new, it's because I'm tired of renting it. Uh, it okay. reaches a threshold that I'm tired of spending money and giving money to other companies to do the job. And I'm just like, you know, we started with lighting. I was tired of renting lighting for every show we did. So I bought enough lights to do like an SL260, you know, little town festival style lighting rig. And then that kept growing. And then every time we've added something, it's because I've had to rent it so much where I'm just like, let's just put the money into the company and start making money with it instead of, you know, as much as I love working with other companies, like we frequently do, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to do it in-house too. And people, it, clients these days love one-stop shops. They like to have one person that can handle everything and not have to deal with, you know, four or five different vendors to get the job done. Fantastic. I imagine a lot of the clients that you deal with for these local things don't typically deal in production. So it saves them some thinking. Yeah, Steve is definitely the king of talking to people that don't know what they need and uh, he can help them out all the time. Yeah, yeah sure. I just want to point out. Oh, sorry, go, Steve. Uh, yeah, bud. I just want to point out, like, uh, these pictures here are gigs where everything that you see is ours. Nice. Yep. Firefly. Uh, we do a lot of stuff at uh, UMBC. They got a nice uh, arena there. Some cool stuff. Yeah, it's nice having all of the inventory in house. You know, it, it just makes it easier. Yeah, and uh, back back to the other point. I mean, with with anything in life, a lot of the decision makers aren't well versed in 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 what they need or the technical side of things. Uh, so if people come to us with a concept, 
we're able to help them visualize it and point them in the right direction and say, you need this, you don't need this, please don't do that. Um, we highly recommend this. And uh, we do have a rep reputation of being a one-stop shop and we've, we've done every type of gig. Uh, we have every type of gear now. So it's you know very easy for, for people at this point, thankfully, to, to put their trust in us. And if there's something I don't know, I go to the guys and I ask them and it's, uh, we very much help each other out here as far as all that goes. Right. So, so coming from, Evan, this comes to you specifically, coming from the touring side of things, um, has it made life a little bit easier for you to answer questions for your guest artist coming through when they... Oh, yeah, definitely. Be, you know, doing all the touring stuff, like, especially at the club level that I started at, you know, you learn a lot about what works, what doesn't work, uh, what to expect, how to talk to people, how to advance shows. And, you know, as the companies continue to grow and we work with larger artists, it's like, well, yeah, I know what you guys need. Like, we can work with you. It's helped my negotiating a lot, too, because, you know, I've had to negotiate with a lot of venues in my touring side. Like, well, I need this console. Well, we have this console. Can you rent this console? There's no budget. All right, well, I'll work with it. And now, you know, I'm on the other side of this, like, well, there's no budget for that console. Can you work with this? And they'll, eventually they'll be like, fine, whatever. And it's just, you know, I'm able to talk to those guys because I, I, you know, I know how frustrating it can be when you're on tour and you can't get exactly what you need and you have to deal with what the local audio right. vendor has. Right. So I want to go to something that I think is the funniest story that I've ever seen in audio in my life. And it comes to is. gear maintenance and destruction at a show and uh what's the craziest potential damage situation you've ever seen hey kyle I, for I you. some pictures somewhere <laughs> oh kyle yeah you got a good one <laughs> i was uh, sleeping this... in the hotel when i got the call for about this one yeah so we had a uh small pop-up stage at firefly and uh you know we were cruising right along during the day and I'm standing at front of house. I believe, I forget who was mixing, but I was standing there. Uh, it was just under a little tent in the grass, you know, on a couple stage decks that were just sitting on the ground. And here comes this guy, Superman, through the tent and into our console. And here, I don't know if you can see it. There he is, sitting on the ground. <laughs> uh, all our stuff everywhere. He was banging on but, the case lids with oh, yeah. a uh, with a empty milk crate. Was he completely and, naked? Is that a thing? But too? naked, but yeah. naked. Yeah. Oh, he there's our console. Runs through the tip. Yeah. So I'm I'm in the hotel room, sound asleep, because I had to be up early that day. I was working, so I had the afternoon off. And Kyle calls me. He's like, "You need to get here right now." Some dude drugged out of his mind just dove through front of house. I'm like, "Oh." god <laughs> trying to fight anybody man he was crazy it's the craziest thing i've ever seen yeah and it's you can uh, the video is on the internet uh i think it's either on my page i think it's on the company uh facebook page yeah it's on the company it. page yeah but it, it's it was just crazy man but nothing was really damaged so thankfully the way the console landed in the grass it was fine a couple scratches the case was a little bent but, you know, everything's held up and survived. And uh, we got a small little settlement out of it. You know, uh, the uh, court from Delaware gave us like 400 bucks. So we all went out and had a nice launch that day. <laughs> so is that, the, is that the craziest damage you've ever seen? Hey, there's another good one that you're forgetting. What am oh, I forgetting, oh, yeah. Zach? I don't know this one. Uh, well, I, th I think it's got to be Kyle's story again. And it involves just a guy trying to drive oh, a street sweeper through the parking lot. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a, a town festival we do every year. Uh, we love those guys. And it's a two-day festival, so we leave the gear overnight. And uh, we had gone out to dinner, and uh, we, have, we always have a celebratory dinner after day one because it's a great festival. It's always easy. And we have a couple to a lot of beverages and, you know, relax and unwind after the day. And uh, I had left my bag at front of house, so after dinner we are walking back over to front of house, and a street sweeper had driven and pushed the barricade into front of house and the street sweeper grabbed the snake for the lighting console and pulled the lighting console out of front of house and flipped it over onto the ground, like in the parking lot. And the guy just kept driving away. 
So Kyle just like chased this dude down and like was yelling at him through the window, like, oh man, you screwed up. Like you just ruined a $20,000 lighting console. And the poor, I feel bad for the guy. Cause give me your name and number right at. now. <laughs> Who do you work for? <laughs> like Kyle's a pretty big intimidating guy. And like when he gets angry and going like stay out of his way. But again, you know, the console was fine. Uh, everything survived. And uh, it just made for another good story. We haven't really had any, cr- you know, crazy destruction to our gear. A Shamrock like, Fest you know got, a, got a little out of control yeah. with uh, tents literally being lifted off the ground and slammed back, slammed back down. And just, you know, we had a, I believe it was a, a DJ. Uh, we had like a deck stage under there. And we had, you know, I, I forget what gear we had under there. Nothing got destroyed, I don't think, but things were mangled for sure. Yeah, it was uh, in March of all, all months. Like, you never expect a supercell to come through. And there's 60 mile per hour winds in front of this storm. It snowed, it hailed, it poured down rain. Wow. It completely destroyed two of the DJ tents. But all of our gear, like, fell perfectly that nothing got hurt. Like, we had uprights with lights on them, and they fell, like, into the railings. So the light was fine, just suspended in the air. Everything Divine intervention. Su- yeah, everything yeah. survived perfectly. I mean, the tents were destroyed. And, uh, you know, the st- our stages were fine. We had our brand new SO100 out there and like, go brand figure. Brand new PA too. Yeah. Brand new PA. We just got our V rig and, you know, got poured on the first gig it was out. I was like, go figure. Nice. I still love the streaking Superman story. That's. <laughs> it, it got a lot of views on the internet. I mean, if anything, it did good pr- uh, publicity and promotion for us. <laughs> I, I'm probably 10% of those views. I watched it quite a few times. <laughs> so so uh, we're about to the end of our time here. I, I guess the uh, question that I have is for someone who wants to, to get to working in sound, lighting, video, audio, what's your, what's your biggest uh, advice? Get online and table. learn anything that you can. Get on YouTube. Get on Google. If you have a question, nobody's going to answer it better than Google will. Yep, you can go and search anything, and I'm sure I've answered it in ProSound Web one way or another. <laughs> I always tell people when they want to get involved with this that you should not limit yourself. Don't say, oh, I'm just an audio guy. Oh, I'm just a lighting guy. Learn everything that you can possibly learn if someone is willing to teach you. And if not, do what Kyle said and go on YouTube and go on the Internet and just do everything. Don't you know, give yourself tunnel vision and say, I only do audio. Uh, because that, you know, then you're only valuable in one aspect of this industry. And there's so many areas and different ways that you can get involved with it. And it just expands your network and makes you more valuable as a, you know, as a potential hire. And just, you know, I think people, at, I, at least we do, we like working with smart, abled people who aren't just doing one thing, just somebody that we know if we're at a show and something happens, I, we can ask someone, any one of us can push buttons on the lighting console if something happens. Any one of us can pull up a monitor mix. Any one of us can, you know, turn the video wall on and stuff like that. And I think that's really important for people that want to get into this is just to try and learn everything because it just makes you more valuable. And, call- and, don't, and don't be afraid to ask questions either. I mean, I've had to selling things, um, you know, that at the, at, you know, and even, you know, at some point now, but especially when I started here, um, you know, I'm selling things that I didn't exactly know how they worked or what they are and, and asking questions and, you know, being honest with your coworkers um, and to being able to effectively, you know, to deploy a rig and sell something to somebody. I mean, you have to, it, it helps to have smart people, you know, by your side and uh, open lines of communication for sure. And call your local production companies and pester them until they let you come intern in the shop. Go out, push cases, wrap cables, learn about the shop stuff, ask questions, and don't give up. Be relentless. Like some of the best people we've hired bugged the crap out of me for years just wanting to be involved. And finally, like I was like, okay, we get to a point where we need somebody just to be at the gig, just be another body to help. And then they learn and they keep coming back and they keep learning. So never stop learning. Find local companies and just, you know, do whatever you can to keep making yourself more valuable. I want to say too, whoever you meet out doing this stuff, audio, anywhere, it doesn't matter. Don't piss them off and don't burn bridges because you never know when you're going to see them again and you never know where they're going to be later in a position of power or, or a 
good contract or a good client. So, you know, don't burn bridges and try to be, you know, cool with everybody you meet. They can be, you know, a mean person or whatever, but just don't let it get to you. Don't burn those bridges. See the same people on the way up that you see on the way down. Exactly. Oh, yeah. For sure. That's a, that's a slogan that I heard a lot and I've, I've seen it bite a lot of people. So that's good stuff. So uh, Evan, you, you, you said something that's uh, interesting to me. You say for the people interested to get into this, knock on doors, knock on doors and don't give up. That gives you a good sense that they really want to do what they really want to do. And yep, absolutely. that goes back to something you said earlier that, you know, hire for attitude. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to so. see the dedication. Like if you send me an email with a resume, I, you know, I might look at it, but I'm going to forget about you. Like, I'm sorry, we have a lot going on. <laughs> and I, I don't mean to sound rude when I say that, but you, people are easily forgotten. And if you want to make an impression, show up at the place, like, you know, ask to talk to somebody, like make that effort. Like I had one, one of our best now freelance guys randomly email me. I kind of ignored it. He called the next day and said, Hey, can I come down and talk to you? And I was like, yeah, sure. Came down, talked to me. We ended up going out to lunch, having a couple beers. And now he's like one of our top hires for freelance guys because he just made that impression and he's a great worker. So like, you know, you gotta, you gotta get out there and put yourself in a position to be seen. I love it. Absolutely. Andy, anything else from your side before we start our close here? No, I just want to say thanks for joining and giving us some insights into your company and some great advice there. Uh, that's it from me. Thank you so much. Thanks thank for having us. And yeah, thank you, guys. guys. Guys, thanks for everything you, you guys have done. You're working with us in the past, Evan. Um, Jack, I know you guys have been part of our panels and everything you do with the happy hour, which made my weeks for a couple of weeks. Thank you. And uh, thanks for joining us today and giving your insight. And we really yeah, appreciate always, it. Always happy to be uh, involved, Tim. Yeah, and thanks, thanks for everyone who's watching out there and who will watch in the future. This will be on YouTube later on. And um, we really do appreciate it. Please check out Sennheiser.com slash webinars for what else is coming up. And we hope to see you all soon. And uh, with that, we'll say goodbye. All Have right. a great day. Thanks, guys. See ya. Bye, guys. Thanks, Thank guys. you.